Welcome to episode 15 of Caucus Live by the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus. Audio. Here we go. <laughs> Welcome to episode 15 of Caucus Live by the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus. I'm your host, Sarah Houtman. Today we're going to talk about hunting. If you don't come from a family with a an outdoor tradition, how the heck do you get started hunting? What kind of gear do you need? What can you hunt if you don't own land? And maybe most importantly, why is hunting important in outdoor conservation efforts? And how can we help reverse the declining numbers of hunters and safeguard, safeguard our outdoor spaces for the future? Stick around to find out. Welcome to episode 15 of Caucus Live by the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus. We're broadcasting live from Maplewood, Minnesota. Let us know you're wa where you're watching from. And as always, if you have questions during the show, try to get them in before we go to break. We've talked a lot about self-defense lately. And while that's an important topic, there's a lot more to the firearms world than just self-defense. Definitely keep an eye out for future episodes. We're going to start talking about everything from shooting sports to uh, shooting gear to environmental hazards and other community interest topics. This season of Caucus Live will go to December 16th, and uh, we've got a lot to cover. This week, we're going to talk about hunting. Uh, a lot of New gun owners uh, grow up in families, uh, or sorry, excuse me, a lot of existing gun owners grow up in families uh, with a hunting, hunting tradition. Um, but for those of us who didn't, it can be hard to imagine where to even start, especially if you're new to this. So do you just go like sit in the woods with a rifle? I mean, how do you know where to go, how to find game, how to process game? And additionally, there are some community concerns as well. So how do hunters help protect wildlife habitats? And is the declining number of hunters putting our outdoor spaces at risk? These are big issues to consider. Today, we've got a panel of experienced hunters who will join us on a deep dive into hunting. Kate Arnson used to be primarily a competitive shooter, but she dipped her toes into hunting five years ago and ended up jumping in with both feet. She now hunts waterfowl, turkey, upland birds, deer, antelope, and is about to embark on her first elk hunt. She and her husband, Dan, own a gun store in Eden Prairie, Arns and Arms. Jared Hinton, Hinton uh, we call him JJ, is an avid hunter and outdoors enthusiast who has spent most of his adult life finding ways to maximize his time of field. JJ has spent the last 10 years working in the shooting sports industry from loading shotgun shells to corporate public relations. The goal is to maximize the number of days he can spend hunting, shooting, and fishing. JJ will be discussing the R3 movement in hunting and the ways to make meaningful strides to foster the next generation of hunting in the public. Pat Watson is a native Minnesotan and a resident of Mendota Heights. Check him out, he's also running for mayor. Professionally, he advises and consults with companies on the global shipment of dangerous goods. Pat has been a hunter of small game all his life, but was an adult onset deer hunter, having had the good fortune to marry into a family with a deer hunting tradition. He fancies himself a wild game foodie who processes and cooks anim every animal he harvests. Pat is an aficionado of Labradors and fine whiskeys and believes the two go well together when enjoying a campfire at the end of a long day. So let's jump right into the topic, guys. I'm going to kind of pick on you at random. So what what made you decide to start hunting and why do you hunt? Pat, let's start with you on that one. 
Well, thank you, Sarah. Um, and thanks to the caucus for putting this on. I started hunting. So I, I grew up in a family that were occasional grouse hunters. Uh, literally, if they happened to be north on the weekend and brought a shotgun, they might take a walk down the trail. And if there happened to be a grouse that walked across the trail or flew across the trail, they'd shoot it. Uh, that was my experience grouse hunting. It wasn't great. I think I got one. And then in my 20s, when I met my wife, or my now wife, uh, her family had some property up near Mille Lacs, and I was able to uh, get out and bird hunt a little more often and actually was invited to their deer camp. And so, you know, started deer hunting. And it was something I really enjoyed the camaraderie of it. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, just being out in the woods and being by myself for hours and hours and hours, you know, read a good book. I'd, I'd enjoy nature. I'd take pictures. And it was something where I, I enjoyed the experience more than, uh, more than actually harvesting something. So, and now I, I'll, I'll go out. Uh, I'll, I like this year, I'm not even going to bring a gun into the deer stand. I'm going to let my kids shoot and I'll help them butcher and, teach them how to, how to cut apart the deer. So this is the year when we're going to learn how to butcher. So. Oh, that's awesome. That's continuing that outdoor tradition. Trying to. Yeah, that's great. Uh, so JJ, how about you? How did you get started and why do you hunt? You know, I, uh, I grew up in a hunting family, uh, not all that much different from Pat. Uh, I grew up hunting in, uh, Northeastern Minnesota, mostly centered around deer hunting. Uh, we shot some grouse here and there, uh, occasionally, uh, as it was convenient. Uh, as I got older into my formidable years, got in into my teens, I started to explore more hunting options, got into waterfowl hunting, uh, and really fell in love with upland hunting, uh, to the point now where. Uh, I've moved west to live out here in Utah now, and so far I've already hunted uh, Utah, Wyoming, Idaho. I'm, I'll be back in Minnesota hunting over the week of Thanksgiving. Uh, I'll be making a trip down to Arizona to, to hunt some quail yet this fall. Um, you know, But as well, I, I big game hunt as well. So I, I was in the mountain all weekend last weekend chasing uh, mule deer, and uh, this weekend, tomorrow morning, I'm heading back up to actually try and get that tag punch. So, um, you know, I've just kind of kind of – evolved all the way through the different styles and types of hunting found found where i like and uh you know there are times that i want to be a solitary hunter uh, when i'm in the mountain i love the contemplative nature of just being out there uh, by myself and time to think and clear my head and there are other times where it's a highly social activity uh, particularly upland hunting for me is a very very social activity where you know, we get to run around, chase dogs around all day long and shoot the bull all day long and, uh, you know, just have a good time and sit down and have a nice hearty dinner and a beer afterwards and, and you know, really just connect with people on a one-to-one -one basis. Oh, that sounds awesome. And so what exactly is upland hunting? So like most things you hunt, like the name of the animal you're hunting is in the name, right? So like you're deer hunting, obviously you're hunting deer. What are you hunting when you're upland hunting? So generally upland hunting would be considered upland birds. Uh, so the, the differentiation when it comes to upland when and birds would be waterfowl. Uh, so obviously birds that utilize water, uh, ducks, geese, uh, cranes, uh, species like that versus, uh, you know, upland game, which would be grouse, pheasant, uh, but even moving over into some other species like rabbit hunting. Oh, very cool. Good to know. Uh, so Kate, how about you? Why do you hunt and how'd you get started? Um, so I did not come from a hunting family at all, um, or shooting family, but um, long story short, I ended up owning a gun store with my husband. We got deep, deep into guns, um, and so I was surrounded by a lot of people, a lot of um, employees who were big-time hunters. Uh, so eventually, one of them invited me out duck hunting, and I really, really enjoyed it. And after that, I kind of found another friend who really wanted to get into more hunting in Minnesota, and we just started driving around trying to figure out good duck spots and then we started driving around trying to figure out um, you know where we could go pheasant hunting where we could go grouse hunting um, and then I got invited a couple times to go deer hunting with people and that kind of got my feet wet there kind of started to learn the ropes how to go about doing that and after that um, same friend we decided we we're gonna go try to do western hunting so um, we got antelope tags went out and did that um, and kind of really fell in love with uh, Western hunting after that point. Um, so now I'm applying for tags in Arizona, Wyoming, um, Colorado, heading out to Colorado next week to uh, go on my first elk hunt. So that's really exciting. Uh, I'd say, you know, I, I really love the outdoor adventure. 
every time I hunt, interesting things happen. I see things I never would have seen before. You know, you experience things at, at sunrise that you normally, you know, don't normally ever get to see. And just all sorts of weird, interesting things happen outdoors while you're hunting. Um, so I'd say that's huge. And then uh, I really enjoy the meat as well. Um, I, I like cooking it and I, I've gotten really into butchering everything myself, processing it all myself. And uh, I enjoy that aspect of it. And I pretty much don't really buy red meat at home anymore. Um, so I kind of enjoy, you know, stocking myself <clears throat> that way. And I, I enjoy eating food that uh, I kind of, you know, obtained and, and uh, provided myself. Yeah, I really like that aspect of it, too. So I don't hunt. I'm coming at this from the perspective of like the total newbie, you know, <laughs> stand in for the audience here. Um, but but that's really cool. It's like a game that you know was humanely harvested it because you harvested it yourself. And, you know, um, it's all natural, I guess. Right. <laughs> you know Organic. exactly how it was handled. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yep. yep. Yeah, that's cool. And I, I like the concept of being closer to your food source. I think that's mm -hmm. probably a good and healthy thing just in general. Yep. Uh, so so I'm going to kind of switch it up on you guys a little bit here. Um, what what kind of game do you like to hunt best and why? We'll start with you again on that, Pat. <laughs> um. Man, I really liked a prairie dog hunt that I went on, and it's not really hunting in a traditional sense because it's mainly uh, pest eradication. And I'm going to go back to what I enjoyed most about it uh, is kind of like what Jared was talking about with the camaraderie and things like that. It's it's always a group activity whenever I've gone. It's never been um, a solitary deal. And I took, uh, my favorite one was I took a, uh, I took a couple of British guys one time, uh, prairie dog hunting. And we, I, I said, you know, guys, we're going to go on this prairie dog hunt. We're going to go to South Dakota. You're going to buy licenses. I'll show you how it works. Man, did we have a good time? Uh, I think it was horrible hunting, but we just had a great time driving out in the boonies and going to these cowboy bars. And the one guy's like, Hey, are we going to see a cowboy? And I was like, well, you know, that's, that's kind of like rodeo thing. Turns out the rodeo was in town and they all came into the bar that night. And <laughs> I just, this was like five years ago and I went with these guys and on LinkedIn the other day, the guy retired and he was relating the story of meeting the cowboys in the bar in South Dakota. And I was like, see, that's, that's, that's hunting to me. I loved it. I mean, you know, we shot a couple of prairie dogs, but man, we got some good stories out of that deal. So I'd have to say that'd be my, about my favorite one. Yeah. That's like a life changing experience for people. Right? Yeah. Very cool. And JJ, how about you? Uh, for me, you know, despite the fact that I work for the Mule Deer Foundation, uh, for me, it's upland hunting is really my passion. Uh, chasing chasing a bird dog around the prairie or through the woods, um, and and just that moment of the flush, that that excitement when you know your dog is 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 on a bird and watching a watching a, a, a dog really that's been bred for that purpose and watching them put all their tools to use is something to me that's uh, exceptionally special um but that doesn't discount some of the other hunting uh, i love big game hunting uh for the fact that i love to fill my freezer with uh you know fresh meat that i know where it came from and um when it comes to straight gunning uh and the shooting side of it uh, to me there's nothing better than a you know a late season diver duck hunt uh, when you talk about uh, skill sets uh, of shooting, uh, that is that is paramount in that that particular pursuit. So, uh, for me, I'd say Upland's definitely number one, but it's hard for me to to rank anything else, uh, you know, secondary to that. Uh, they're they're all pretty awesome. And Kate, how about you? What's your uh, favorite type of game? I would have to say, um, so far, it would be antelope. Um, I've done that three times now, and it's just a really fun, exciting um, spot and stalk style hunt, meaning you see them from far away. I mean, sometimes you can see them from over a mile away, um, and then you have to figure out how to maneuver in, you know, to sneak up within a, you know, ethical shooting distance. Um, so it's, it's really exciting and, and really fun. And it's a kind of a totally different landscape from Minnesota too. So I feel like I'm, I'm getting out and getting out, you know, into a, in a cool new world. And it's just a really interesting, fun style hunt, but I'd have to agree. Upland is a close second, um, just because it is so fun, um, working your dog. 
Uh, you've never seen a happier dog in your life than uh, Upland Dog when, when he's getting to hunt. I mean, my dog is just overjoyed anytime you can do that. So I'd, I'd have to say that's a, that's a close second, a lot of fun too. We're going to talk a little bit more about dogs. I think in our third segment, we'll try and, and fit that in there. Uh, but before we get to that, uh, where, so like when you're starting out in this, you know, and it, again, from the perspective of somebody who's totally new to all of this, where do you even start? It just seems kind of overwhelming. So where, um, where did you guys learn your hunting skills and did you have like a mentor or somebody who taught you and how did you find that person? Uh, JJ, we'll start with you on that one. You know, I'm, uh, I'm thankful to, that I came from a hunting family and that's really where I got to my first introduction, but, uh, I've done an awful lot of skill development on my own. I do a lot more hunting than, uh, than pretty much anybody else in my family and, and a much more diverse mix of hunting. Uh, an awful lot of that has been, uh, just DIY going out there, learning the hard way, what works and what doesn't work. Um, and ultimately, uh, through anybody's progression through becoming a hunter, they're going to have to spend some time, uh, whether they start with a mentor or decide to start purely on their own, uh, there's going to become a development time where you have to learn your skill sets on your own because you can only be taught so much. You have to, you really have to absorb the experience. Um, you know, I think mentorship and I think uh, having mentors is definitely important, but it's not a one size fits all. Some people do learn better independently than they do from somebody else. And uh, so we need to be able to embrace that as well and make sure that people are supported in, in that right as well. Yeah, absolutely. And Pat, let's go to you next. Well, not having, I mean, I had bird hunting, bird hunting uh, mentors growing up, but, um, and I learned my firearm safety, obviously from, from them. But when I think about like deer hunting, I, I, the deer hunting I started out doing was shoot your deer, take it, got it, take it to the processor. Um, And gutting it, I think gutting my first deer was not good. Um, it was extremely messy and I got just grossed out by it and I wasn't even sure if I did it right. And so I, you know, I did, did what I thought it was. I took it to the processor down the road. The processor looks at me and he goes, first deer. And I was like, yeah, he goes, can I give you some pointers? And I said, absolutely. What do you got? He showed me how to do everything, how to take the, can I say, butt? take the butt out. <laughs> um, Amongst other things. And uh, it was great because he showed me all I needed to know. And the next time I may still made a mess of it, but it looked better. And the third one, it was old hat. And I started actually going out on YouTube and looking up. This is, uh, this is really YouTube hunting videos on how to, you know, butcher deer faster and what the, what the quickest way to get the skin off and all these kinds of things. So when Jared talks about self-directed stuff, um, I, I was the one that first started butchering deer in our camp and it was all based off of stuff I saw on YouTube or people I'd asked. So, you know, we hang out with some of the same folks and I just been like, Hey, how hard is it to butcher a deer? And they're like, can you fillet a fish? Yeah. Do you understand the importance of a sharp knife? Yeah. Do you know what a muscle group is? Sarda. I was like, Oh, cool. So. Yeah. You really can learn anything on YouTube. It's kind of amazing. So yeah. Kate, how about you? So I'm, I'm especially interested in your answer because you said that you kind of uh, came into hunting later and were, were fairly self-directed with it. So how did you learn your hunting skills? Um, so again, was, was taken duck hunting um, once or twice. And uh, my friend and I decided that we wanted to do a lot more hunting after that. And what we did is we used a couple of online tools to find public land. Um, one you can use for free, uh, at least in Minnesota, is the Minnesota DNR Recreation Compass. Um, and you can browse around on that and just find all these spots of public land, um, wildlife management areas or other types of public land. Um, so use that to kind of identify ones that we thought, okay, maybe this will be a good waterfall spot. Maybe this will be a spot we can go and try and find pheasants. Um, use that to try and just kind of hone in on places we could go and just drove around a lot and went to them. Um, so that, that was kind of how I started. Uh, there are much fancier tools out there now, um, that you can pay for, uh, such as Onyx Hunt. 
probably um, the biggest one. It's a really nice tool for finding public land uh, across the country um, and a lot of other nice little tools inside of it. But it's, it's great for, you know, I'm out pheasant hunting. I kind of, you know, walk this whole um, unit, not finding anything. Where can I go next? And you start looking around on the map and driving around and finding where the next piece of public land is that you can go. So I did a lot of that. Mm-hmm. Um, big game after that point, I, you know, it, it really helps to get invited uh, to go with some people who know what they're doing and have done it before because doing that without any experience uh, the first time, I, I have to imagine that would be totally overwhelming. Um, you know, so really, really helps, especially gutting and butchering. Um, you know, I, I'd encourage anyone that really wants to get into deer hunting to just try and, and poke friends who do it until they take you along. And people tend to really want to be nice to, you know, new hunters. Um, you know, they're, they're a little more inclined to, to help you out and hold your hand and everything. Um, but yeah, I, I can't, I can't imagine doing big game, um, without at least having done deer first. I think once you've done deer and you, you've learned how to gut and butcher it, or at least gut it so you can take it to a processor, um, you know, I think that kind of opens up a lot of windows and you can start figuring out on your own how to do a lot of other types of hunting and learning from YouTube and and that kind of thing. So that actually brings me to uh, our next question. We do have to take a quick break here, but before we go, I want to touch on this a little bit. Uh, So there have been kind of consistently declining numbers of hunters over the last few decades here. Uh, So I I just want to address that. Uh, So why does the declining number of hunters matter? And like, how does that affect the state of the world. And I'm going to start with JJ on that. We get to pick on you a lot because that's kind of your specialty. Yeah, no, I'm happy to talk about that. Uh, you know, so what's really unique about n- the United States and particularly North America and it's the North American water- wildlife uh, uh, model. Uh, the United States is one of the few places, or the North America particularly, is, is the few places in the world where wildlife are, have been continuously held as a public commodity. Uh, there is no private ownership of, of uh, wildlife. Uh, it doesn't matter if that whitetail grew, deer grew up on your property, lived its entire life on your property, you have no ownership of that animal. And uh, so that kind of leads to the importance of, uh, uh, of wildlife management and, and a lot of that is funded. The vast majority of wildlife management, uh, upwards of 80 percent of it is funded from federal excise taxes and license sales. Uh, so federal excise taxes, for those that aren't familiar with them, are on firearms and ammunition uh, and archery equipment. There's an 11 percent federal excise tax that's paid for by the manufacturer before it makes it down to your retail store. Uh, that money goes into a collected pool of the federal government and uh, and then is allocated to the states based on a, a, a matrix of, of factors. But the primary factor on that is the overall number of hunters. So most of our wildlife management is paid for by hunters here in the United States. And we're seeing some dramatic de- declines. Uh, this is a problem that we've known about uh, inside of the industry for the better part of 30 years. Um, and the numbers are really, really, really staggering when we really look at out at it. So, you know, from 1991 to 2011, we saw 400,000 fewer hunters, which really seems like a modest decline when we're looking at 40 million total hunters. But we also have to look at that in the matrix of the population growth that's occurring at the same time. So, you know, in 1991, one in 6.3 people were a hunter here in the United States. By 2001, that was one to eight people was a hunter. Now, if we looked at further census data uh, from 2001, moving all the way forward to, uh, from and jump forward from 2011 to 2016, we saw a decline just in that uh, t- five year time period of 2.2 million hunters. And when we look at our overall hunter numbers, uh, over 30% are of the baby boomer generation. And those folks aren't passing on their hunting ethics, their genes any longer. Uh, And so we're going to continue to see uh, large declines in hunters long term if we're not careful and if we don't take significant steps to recruit new individuals. Yeah, that seems like a major factor. So we've got to take a quick break here. Before we go, I want to put a call out to 
everybody out there, whether you're a member of the Gun Owners Caucus or not, uh, we could really use some help door knocking in Bemidji. So that's where you go. You knock on doors. You've got, uh, you know, some some talking points to talk to people about. Uh, and we could really use some help with that. So if you're interested in helping out, go to the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus Facebook page, click on events and uh, check it out there. There's all the details you need to know. All right, so quick break here. When we come back, we're gonna be talking a little bit more about uh, hunter recruitment and some of the pra practical aspects of getting started in hunting. Hi, it's Brian Strauser, chairman of the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus. We are a single issue, nonpartisan Second Amendment advocacy group. Our mission is to protect and advance the right of citizens to keep and bear arms. We believe that law abiding citizens should be able to own and use firearms for all lawful purposes, including self defense, competition, hunting, and the shooting sports. Please consider joining us as a Second Amendment defender with support as low as $5 a month, or choose one of our other annual membership options. You can learn more about us at gunowners.mn and become a member at gunowners.mn slash join. Welcome back to Caucus Live by the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus. Today we are talking about hunting. And real quick before we get into our next question, we've got an audience question here uh, that I thought was kind of interesting. Uh, and... I'll address this one generally. Maybe, JJ, this might be a good one for you. But uh, this one comes from Gary. He says, how does one follow the Pittman-Robertson money and how it's spent? So I don't know if that's too much of a topic to get into now, but do you have an opinion on that or uh, anything you want to weigh in on? That is publicly available data. Uh, you can get that. It's just a very complicated matrix and probably would warrant its own show, uh, just trying to break that down um, state by state and, and how that money is, is spent. Uh, and, and there are concerns about that. Uh, you know, as we see a changing demographic of shooters overall in this country, uh, we're seeing less hunters, more shooters. And uh, so that's that's led to, led to some actual real reforms in the last couple of years about creating more habitat, not just for hunters, but also from shooters. Uh, we saw NSSF push a, a, a bill through Congress, uh, I want to say two years ago, Pat, you probably remember that uh, the Gun Ranges Act that, that was pushed through yeah. to try and fund gun, state gun ranges to make more accessibility for shooters because uh, shooters that aren't hunter are carrying a significant amount of burden of wildlife management in, in this country. All right. Well, thanks for answering that one. Uh, now, just to kind of tag back to what we were talking about before the break here, what can we do to help connect with people and encourage more participation in hunting in the outdoor sports? And, and JJ, I'll start with you again, but I want to touch on everybody because I think you guys might all have different perspectives on this. So, uh, Jared, let's start with you. You know, the uh, the easiest thing I'd say for myself as a hunter is uh, is really just take a look at around uh, the people that are around us uh, for the, the you work in an office. You've got the guy that comes down to your office on Monday morning and says, hey, uh, did you catch any deers this weekend? Uh, that's probably somebody that actually has an interest <laughs> in hunting. Uh, <laughs> And, you know, Pat, you laugh, but you, you know it's true uh, as well. Uh, you know, uh, I, I live out here out west now, and the amount of people that I see out hiking, uh, you know, just talking to them and just saying, hey, you know, I'm going to go out shed hunting this weekend, which is a, an off-season pursuit that's not actual hunting. It's just kind of me uh, getting out and scouting for deer and inviting that person out and just saying, hey, would you like to come? And trying to foster that connection uh, any way we can to try and connect people to what's going on with around the, uh, are, I think is a tremendously important. So uh, my biggest advocacy on that would just be as a hunter, or any of us that are hunt, just take that opportunity and just invite one person a year. If we invited, if everybody took out one new hunter a year, we would have no problems with declining hunter numbers in, in the future. Yeah, it's a little tough. Um, I, I think it's great to encourage people to make that offer because I know for me, I wouldn't I wouldn't ask because I wouldn't want to like impose. Um, but if somebody offered, I would like seriously consider it. So I think that really would help. Uh, so I'm Kate, say, let's, somebody did offer. I know you <laughs> did actually two two years ago. I think uh, you did. So I still haven't taken you up on that, but now I I think I will at some point. Uh, so Kate, let's pick on you next. Yeah, I, I would have to totally agree with JJ. That's definitely the biggest thing. And 
I've, I've taken a couple of people hunting that I, I knew were interested and I kind of poked them about it and uh, got them out turkey hunting. And actually this last antelope hunt, I didn't even have a tag, um, but uh, two of the people um, along had never hunted antelope before. One of them had never hunted anything um, and it was his first hunt ever. And that was just super satisfying and super fun. It was just as fun as if I had had a tag. Um, so I, I had a blast. And I would say the biggest thing to other hunters is to take somebody out that hasn't done it before and don't worry about giving away your spot. Um, you know, a lot of hunters, if you're a public land hunter, which, which I'm primarily a public land hunter, are very possessive of their spots, you know, even though it's public land, mm-hmm. um, but, but they get possessive about other people knowing about it. I would say, you know, suck it up, take that new hunter out anyway, and try to get them to have as good of experience as possible. And Pat, what do you think about that? How can we outreach and how can we get new hunters? Well, kind of like what JJ was saying, um, be the, be the gunny, be or be the gunny. Oh goodness. Uh, be, be the hunter for somebody, answer their questions. Um, I had a customer of mine who, uh, saw that I had, uh, I don't remember what it was on Facebook. He had seen that I'd gone hunting and he was like, I, are, do you go hunting? And I said, yeah, I did bird hunt, I deer hunt, I squirrel hunt, you know, I hunt. And he's like, well, how do I, how do I deer hunt? You know? And so we, we chit chatted about that on a couple of calls and we met in person a couple of times and talked about it. And unfortunately I don't have a gap at my deer camp to invite anybody. Um, otherwise I would, but I did help him hook into another group that I knew that hunted public land and they ended up going midweek and this is his first, or they're going midweek this year. They're going to go uh, opening week of deer season and he's going for his first deer hunt with a, with a group of guys. And I was pretty happy to, uh, to see that he was doing that. You know, I had advised him on, on how to work through public land. So kind of like what Kate was saying, uh, check your plat maps, check Onyx, um, you know, look for options. Don't go opening weekend. I told him, I said, I said, if you guys can take time off midweek, go midweek, avoid the orange army. Um, opening weekend deer season in Minnesota public land is a nightmare. I just tell people, I was like, if you want to have a good experience, don't go opening weekend because it's going to be ridiculous. But so they're going to go midweek and they're going to, they're actually going to bike in um, to a spot up north. Uh, I think they're biking in about a mile and a half, which is another thing because once you get in more than half a mile, as we all know, you don't see anybody else. So um, that's, you know, just, just be free with your advice. Uh, If you can like, Kate said, share your spots. Um, I was talking to somebody about the Minnesota River Bottom today, and I was like, there's tons of places to go duck hunting down along the Minnesota River Bottom. I was like, go on to Onyx, look for access points, go throw some deeks out in the river and shoot ducks. It's like, it's one of the easier things you can do. So just share. Share, be a mentor, even if it's just by talking to them. And uh, JJ, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, I, I just saw two comments that rolled in that were specifically targeted at youth hunting. And, and I, I have no problem with us encouraging youth hunting, but uh, there's plenty of demographic data and there's plenty of data out there that I can point you to that will tell you that when we hold youth hunting experiences, uh, be it state agencies, NGOs, uh, we tend to be re- preaching to our own choir and not to the, cu- uh, to the pews. And uh, the numbers tell us that we tend to host youth, youth events at over a 90% rate of people that are already going to be exposed to hunting. That's, there's nothing wrong with that, but that's not the demographic. That's not the area that we need to be focusing on right now. We need to start uh, focusing on people that particularly in their 20s plus that either have kids or potentially are going to be having kids in the future that are going to foster that next generation. It's not enough to focus on our youth because that is shown Uh, The data tells us that focusing solely on youth hunters uh, is going to continue to cause declines in the long-term hunter numbers. So we have to go outside of just talking about encouraging kids to hunt. We need to start getting adults involved. Ah, that's really interesting. I hadn't thought of it from that perspective, but it does kind of make sense. Yeah, and I I have seen uh, in my my age group, there is kind of like this... um, I don't mean this disrespectfully, but there's a little bit of a hipster vibe um, to, for hunting, which I think is actually kind of cool because that might get some more like city people out hunting. And that's great. Like we totally need that. Well, and we that's see actually a tremendous divide. 
between urban and, and rural communities on where the engagement numbers are in overall mm -hmm. hunting. And uh, obviously rural areas see much larger participating in, in, participation in hunting in general. So, uh, you know, seeing that, you know, hipster revival of uh, getting involved, uh, the foodies getting involved, uh, that's going to be tremendously important as uh, particularly when we look at the politics long term of hunting to make sure that we don't end up in a situation and we're rapidly approaching that where we have a uh, uh, urban community that votes one way that is not necessarily pro hunting and we have a rural community divide that votes pro hunting pro gun and that's something that just just along with the the gun rights line is something that we have to be cognizant of and be aware of that we ha we can't we can't just preach to our own choir we have to start looking outside of us hunting right now in the united states is 90 percent caucasian that's a really scary number. And of that number, 75 to 85% depends on the state is white males. That's Those are real problems for us long-term if we don't start to address that and bring people that don't look like us out hunting. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, I think that's really where the, what you were saying earlier about like make the offer. I think that's where that can be really important because, you know, like depending on how well you know someone, and depending on what your relationship is, they might it not, might not even occur to them to ask you to take them hunting. Like that might not even be on their radar, but maybe if you offer, maybe now it's on their radar. And Pat, you well, made eye contact. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just hey, gonna say, uh, you know, when we look at the data, it tells us very that the two biggest hurdles that most uh, potential new hunters on survey data and focus group data tell us that uh, that the two biggest stumbling blocks to get new people are involved are one the skill set which that's you know mentorship is important there but then number two is equipment required i i would say that you can walk down to my garage downstairs and easily find 20 to thirty thousand dollars of hunting quit uh, equipment on on the conservative side for me down there <laughs> And that's not talking firearms, that's just talking equipment. You know, when you're talking $400 hunting boots and a $300 jacket and a $400 pair of bibs and having one of those for multi different seasons and all those, you know, that's a, that's a huge stumbling block. And for those of us that are hunters, we have a lot of that equipment laying around that we can be providing and, and helping new hunters out to at least get started. Yeah, do they have in the gun community? So I come from like the horse world and we've got tax swaps where you take all your used stuff to a swap and then, you know, people can buy it on consignment. Is there anything like that for hunting? Not a lot. <laughs> I've never heard of it, but then again, I don't hunt, so I probably wouldn't have. Um, but I do want to get into. Oh, go ahead, Pat. As I say, that's why all the old hunters die with tons and tons of hunting gear in closets and bins yeah. because they right. never <laughs> clean it out or anything. I mean, every old guy I know who's passed away has a big freaking Rubbermaid tote full of old camo <laughs> and moldy God knows what in a basement somewhere. So, yeah, I mean, those of us who are more experienced, if we have an extra set of bibs or we have an extra set of boots or we have neoprene gloves or we've got, you know, um, extra stuff – give it away. I mean, if, at the very least, sell it on the used market because there are people who will absolutely snap that up and then they don't have to go to Cabela's and buy a $400 pair of boots. Um, it, 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 people always look at me and they're like, do I have to buy Thinsulate, Gore-Tex, XYZ PDQ, Winchester S SX3 shotgun? You know, do I have to buy all this top of the line stuff? And I was like, the most fun I've ever had was a leaky pair of rubber waders that I bought at Goodwill and an 870 Express shotgun that I bought for a buck and a quarter. So I'm like, you know, <laughs> you know, not let's, be as, <laughs> as fun. yeah, no, no, let's, let's actually jump into that now since our conversation kind of went that way. So we uh, had planned to get to that in the third segment, but let's start now. So what equipment do you need at a minimum or, or you know what, let me backtrack one little bit first. So as a new hunter, is there a certain type of game that you think is more accessible? Is there like a starter hunting like, what do you start with? Um, squirrels. Kate, uh, or, yeah. what was that? Squirrels, yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was about to say the same thing. Yeah, small yeah, bands. okay. Absolutely, 
small Rabbit game. Uh, I, I, I don't think it matters what species it is. Uh, that, that kind of, to me, falls into the upland game category. Uh, squirrels, uh, rabbits, I would say 20 years ago, it's tougher and tougher to find rabbits to hunt now. But, uh, you know, upland games, so grouse, uh, pheasants, uh, particularly in Minnesota, those are extremely accessible places for people to get started. Uh, there's a ton of pub public land access. The learning curve is fairly low. You don't have to have a hunting dog to get started. You can kind of just get out and, and go. So from my perspective, absolutely 100% get people started on small game. Okay, yeah, so I've, say you're going to... Oh, go ahead, Kate. You go. I, I was going to agree. Same thing. Small game, um, you just pretty much need to get boots on the ground, and all you need is some orange, you know, some blaze orange, and uh, either a shotgun or a, a, a twenty two. A dog helps, but you don't need it. And then after that, I, I'd say you could also kind of get into um, duck hunting without too much equipment um, with a shotgun and waders if you really want to get out there. Um, but it helps to have a lot of the other equipment for duck hunting. But if you, if you don't, you can still do it. And Pat, what do you think about that? Well, I was going to say, the, I think one of the biggest things you can do, especially with new hunters, is keep them warm and dry uh, when they're mm. going to be out. That's something to encourage. So encourage. And this works because I'm a big outdoors like camping guy, and I go all seasons. So like synthetic fabrics, uh, polypropylene underwear, you know, uh, blend socks, things like that. You don't have to buy the top end smart wool XYZ PDQ, but you can offer that's 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 along the lines of the advice that you can offer them too is how you can keep them warm and dry uh, in the conditions that they're going to be hunting, depending on what the game is, when you're going, and that kind of thing too. I would say on that topic, Pat, uh, absolutely. If I was talking to a new hunter about equipment that you need, uh, particularly for upland hunting, but any hunting period, uh, merino wool base layers are the best single investment that you will make um merino does cost a little bit but it's usefulness across seasons not just oh, yeah. hunting seasons by mm -hmm, the way mm -hmm, for mm -hmm. all your winter sports so anything that you want to do outside in winter it's uh wool is the only fabric that whether it's wet or dry it still has insulative properties and so that is critically important when you're out hunting you build up a sweat you stop for five minutes and you start getting cold uh, merino wool is going to help that. Uh, secondarily, wool is antimicrobial, so uh, you don't stink. Um, most of your synthetic fabrics, uh, you sweat in them, you're going to smell like you've sweat in them. Uh, merino wool, I can go into the mountain and spend five days on the mountain, and I may not smell, you know, daisy fresh when I come out, but I can have worn that one set of long johns uh, all weekend long for four or five days and still not a, be a complete and utter mess, and I will be warm the entire time. So merino wool is 100% worth the money. All right, good to know. Kate, you have something to add real quick? I was going to say, and if you live in Minnesota or any of the other colder climates, you'll suddenly find yourself using it all the time for, for other stuff, too. <laughs> yeah, I suppose you get a lot of use out of that here. Oh, yeah. Uh, all right. So real quick before we jump topics, since we are talking about gear, uh, can you hunt with a suppressor in Minnesota? Anyone want to fit? Yeah, everybody's nodding. Okay, we'll take that as a yes. <laughs> all right. And what about an... Uh, what about an AR-15? Can you hunt with an AR-15? I thought those were like the extra super assaulty rifles, but you can actually hunt with them, right? I have shot more yeah. than one deer with an AR-15. I've shot coyotes with an AR-15. Uh, yes, they're they're definitely a useful tool. Um, you know, caliber-wise, particularly your traditional AR-15 being in 223 or 556. Um, shot selection is going to be a little bit more uh, important on big game, particularly a deer. Uh, you may not have as much flexibility as shooting a 30 cal, but uh, as long as you're keeping your shots within a reasonable range and uh, respective of your shot positions and what your presentations are, there's absolutely no reason not to use an AR-15 in the field. Good to know. All nice. right. I have, I have two young sons and their first deer rifles were AR-15s. Uh, configurable to their size. I could include slings anywhere I wanted to, to make them fit. Uh, they worked so well. And the picture of them with their, ace, um, they took, one of them took it to, forgot which school it was to show his friend the, um, 
the deer hunting picture. You know, here's him and his brother out in the snowy woods with a deer and they're orange with their guns and they're having a great time. And the kid's like, oh, what kind of a gun is that? So we had to have a quick discussion with that kid's parents about, you know, how people actually hunt with those. So. Yeah, that's good outreach too, I suppose. Just passing the knowledge mm -hmm. along. Yeah, that's good stuff. All right, so we do need to take another quick break here. When we get back, uh, we're going to circle back around and talk about some of the rules and regulations about hunting and what you need to be aware of before you start planning. So hang around. We'll be right back. The Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus is a single-issue, nonpartisan Second Amendment advocacy group. Our mission is to protect and advance the rights of citizens to keep and bear arms. We believe that law-abiding citizens should be able to own and use firearms for all lawful purposes, including self-defense, competition, hunting, and shooting sports. Please consider becoming a Second Amendment defender, with support as low as $5 a month. You can learn more at gunowners.mn slash join. Welcome back to Caucus Live by the Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus. This week we're talking about hunting. Uh, we've got a couple audience shout outs here I want to get to. Dustin says hi to Jared's pup. And uh, we do have a rule on this show uh, that pets go full screen. So if I see your pet and if I'm quick enough on the buttons to catch it, uh, then that person will go full screen on the panel. <clears throat> He did. I, oh, oh, hey, speak of the devil. There, there, there we go. There's Yager. Yager the is, Drot. Is that your hunting dog? Yes, yes. Both of my dogs uh, are, are hunting dogs. My lab here, she's not nearly as uh, friendly to, to hopping up in my lap, but we'll see if we can get her on picture. Come here. And then I got a, a red lab as well. So, yes, both are hunting dogs. Uh, both are indoor dogs. And, uh, you know, for my wife and I, we don't have kids. They are they are our children. So, Oh, yeah. Pets are family, I tell you. Uh, you know, before we move on, I, I do have some quick questions about that. Can I just get, like, a show of hands of how many of you guys hunt with dogs? Everybody. Okay. Okay. Now are dogs necessary for hunting or can you, can you go without not necessary? Okay. And uh, let's start with you, Pat. What kind of game do you hunt with your dog and how does the dog help you? Well, since I, my first Labrador I ever had by myself was a phenomenal waterfowl and upland dog. Uh, I had time to train her. I, you know, got out with her all the time. She was fabulous. Uh, then I had kids. And my two subsequent Labradors got not as well trained. So I'm working on my most recent one. She's uh, she's a pointing lab of all things. I uh, didn't know it when I got her, but she's a pointing lab. So I'm teaching her how to uh, go on point for grouse. And she's she's got maybe a 25% hit rate right now. So <laughs> we're working on it. Good effort, though. And Kate, what about you? What kind of dog do you have? And how does the dog help you? What kind of game do you hunt? Um, he is a wire-haired pointing griffin, so he's uh, also a pointer. Um, he is great for pheasant, um, grouse, and woodcock. So he helps me find the birds and either flush them out or point at them. And it, it's just a super fun time going with the dog because the dog is just having the time of their life. He's not so good with ducks because he um, will not retrieve them. So he usually gets left home for duck hunting. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I got to say, it's it's so much fun hunting with a dog in Upland and seeing the dog work and do their job and flush out that game for you or, or find them for you. It gets to be kind of addictive to the point where if you don't have the dog or the dog is worn out or injured, you're kind of like, oh, I don't know if I want to go. So I'd say that's almost the, the one downside to it is because now I'm totally spoiled by having my dog with that I'm not as interested, you know, in going grouse hunting or whatever if he's out of commission. Yeah, that's like a great family bonding activity. Bond with your pet family. <laughs> And uh, JJ, did you mention what kind of game your dogs hunt? I didn't. I don't remember if you said that or not. Uh, you know, uh, uh, primarily upland. So uh, my my uh, Drodar uh, also does uh, as well as birds does for retrieves. So he'll retrieve coyotes, fox, uh, rabbits, which a lot of uh, breeds like Labradors, uh, more of the straight retriever breeds, are are bred for retrieving birds only. Um, for me, just having a dog, well, a uh, you know, bringing a, a a pheasant back in my mouth is really dries me out, and I have a whole lot of stuff to pull out of my mouth when I do that. So <laughs> that dog makes it a lot easier on the retrieve. Um, but secondarily, it's just, it's just the amount of ground you can cover. 
Um, you know, when you're working through a field, upland hunting, uh, if you're without a dog, you need to do a lot of quartering. So you're kind of just walking back and forth at 45 degree angles. Um, I can only cover so much ground, uh, with a dog consistently. And I've GPS my dogs to confirm this. They're covering, covering three to five times as much ground as I can personally cover. So just the amount of their ability to cover ground and then obviously scent animals to help uh, locate them, to get me closer to them, to, to get more ethical shots is, is critical. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah. And I want to give a quick shout out to Benjamin who just joined the caucus. Thanks for joining. All right. So uh, let's see, we've got a audience question here we might want to just grab it this will probably be a fairly quick one uh but andrew was asking uh is there a shotgun that's good for both bird and deer hunting uh maybe some clay pigeon shooting as well any particular recommendations for that jared you made eye contact oh uh, pat, yeah i'm pat. happy to answer uh, well, we'll get to Pat next. We'll go for, we'll go with me. I, I'd imagine Pat's sediments aren't too far off of my own. Uh, you know, 10 years ago, I'd say, uh, you know, go buy yourself a Remington 870. These days, uh, I'm a little hesitant on Remington, but uh, it's fairly easy to find uh, Mossberg 500s with uh, bird barrel and slug barrel combos. Uh, with a slug barrel, a rifled slug barrel for a shotgun, you're more than capable of shooting deer out to 100 to 125 yards, which uh, in Minnesota is really practical range for most hunters. Yeah. I was going to say, you can pick up a, you can pick up a used Wingmaster 870 right now. Um, granted, this is a weird market. It's a bad time to buy a gun, um, but yeah. you can, you can pick up a used Wingmaster mag or even a two and three quarter Wingmaster. And like Jared said, you can get a rifle barrel for them and you're good out to a hundred with, with Sable slugs. Um, even rifled slugs, you can still probably hit the broadside of a barn with a smooth bore barrel, but um an 870 and Mossberg 500 would be what I'd recommend for both if you're just starting out and you don't have a ton of dough. And let me pick on Kate real quick here because not only does Kate own a gun shop, she owns my favorite gun shop in the Twin Cities, uh, Arms and Arms. So Kate, what's your perspective on that? Like, is it hard to find a shotgun right now? Uh, it is, and it's been especially hard to find a pump action shotgun for a while, uh, especially 870s for some reason. Uh, they've been very, very popular since March or so. Is that a price um, thing or why the pump over the semi? Uh, it's a price thing. Um, gotcha. Pretty much all shotguns under a thousand bucks or so disappeared off the shelves for, for months at a time. Um, and they're, they're coming back. Um, so we're starting to, to see some come back. Uh, the more popular models are gone very quick though because um, people are looking for them or people have pre-orders on them. So it, it, is, it is tough right now to, to get a pump action shotgun. But I would say wait a couple months. I, I expect that we're probably going to see a lot of them on the used market um, sometime, you know, in the future. So it may be a very good time to buy a pump action shotgun in the next year or so. And um, as uh, Pat and JJ have, have um, already touched on, you can buy um, rifled slug barrels for a lot of the shotguns that are out on the market and make it a really versatile gun for both birds and uh, deer hunting. Yeah, that sounds like a I'm just going to quick point out. I'm going to just start talking because they, they <laughs> that lag. Oh, that lag catches up with us. All right, Pat first, then JJ. <laughs> All right, here's here's my one comment on rifle versus smoothbore barrel. Understand the difference and buy the right ammo. I've watched too many people at the range go with a smoothbore barrel and buy in the expensive Sabo slugs, and they can't hit the broadside of a barn because the Sabos aren't getting rifled like they're supposed to. You need to get a rifle barrel if you're going to shoot the expensive Sabo ammo. If you have a smooth bore barrel, you buy standard rifled slugs that are cheap. They're like five bucks a box. That's what you buy. Good to know. And what do you want to add? And I'll just say back to, you know, something we chatted about a little bit earlier, just kind of that gear exchange. I will guarantee that pretty much every hunter that you know has a spare 870 or Mossberg 500 sitting around in the back of their closet that they haven't <laughs> shot for years because they've upgraded and now I'm shooting a Benelli or a Beretta or I went to over-unders or whatever. And most of the time they can be had fairly inexpensively from gun bunnies because we have them around and we don't really have uses for them anymore. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right. So we, uh, you know, we 
we're going to try and keep this to time as best we can, but I, there's a couple things I really want to get to before we, want, we run out of time here. Uh, one of them is a little bit about the rules of hunting. So uh, can, can you tell us what purpose hunting permits serve and what the process is, how to apply for one, and how to be qualified for one? Uh, who's going to make eye contact on this? JJ, you're making eye contact. You're first. I'm always making eye contact. I'm a, I'm a cheap date when it comes to that. Uh, yeah. So hunting licenses, we have to actually consider a hunting seasons. Uh, uh, hunting seasons in this country came about uh, at the turn of the century here as we saw market hunting decimating wild game populations. Uh, so we really look at hunting as a population management tool. And so that is that is really the basics of, you know, when a, a certain population is high, there's going to be more permit availability, particularly when we talk about big game. Um, but really the basics come down to, uh, I believe in Minnesota, it's 1978 is the cutoff. You'll need to have firearm safety uh, to, to acquire a license. But for the most part, uh, most all seasons in Minnesota, you can buy a, a permit over the counter. There's very little special uh, permitting draws, which is much different than where I live now in the West, where when you want to hunt big game, I I apply for a minimum of three states to be able to pull one or two licenses. So that's a, a significant difference just regionally. All right. And then I'd also like to, oh, go ahead, Kate. Yeah. I just wanted to add, um, as an adult, you don't actually have to go and take a classroom hunter safety course if you don't want to. Um, I really didn't want to go take a course with a, with a bunch of kids. Uh, so there are <laughs> online courses available. And if you search for your state, usually, you know, Minnesota hunter safety or whatever, you'll, you'll find them right away. So just wanted to let people know there's an alternative to going and taking a cl classroom class. Yeah. I was wondering about that actually, because uh, that, that also crossed my mind. <laughs> yeah. uh, so who can I pick on it for uh zones. So like, say you're interested in deer hunting. So my understanding is that Minnesota has different zones uh, for shotgun and for rifle and then like different like management areas. Uh, so how do you learn about that? Uh, Pat, let me pick on you for that one. So the DNR has this great uh, fold out map that they distribute with all the paper regs and you can also find it on their website and it uh, it's on a PDF and it you can zoom in on it and it divides the state into all the different uh, zones. So you have the northern zone, the southern zone. So usually your standard deer season is zone one. That's uh, three weekends, two solid weeks. Then you have zone two, which is your southeast corner of the state. And that's generally the week, and Jared's going to have to help me out here. That's the week after Thanksgiving, I want to say. Um, but again, the seasons are all spelled out in there. And then um, there's a dividing line about halfway up the state where north of that you can hunt with any legal firearm. So there's, and this would be during firearm deer season, um, there's rifle, shotgun, handgun, muzzle, you hunt any legal firearm north of that line. South of that line, you have to use shotgun, legal handgun, uh, or muzzle loader, and then after the regular firearm season is over, they have a dedicated muzzle loader season. Usually runs for two weeks uh, after the regular firearm season's over, and you can use a uh, modern muzzle loader uh, with percussion ignition and a scope and whatever whatever you need to for that one. So, and are there special accommodations accommodations for people with disabilities in hunting? Yeah, if you have a, a legitimate disability, you can uh, work with your doctor to get a uh, you know permission slip uh, from the DNR uh, that will allow you to uh, shoot from a motor vehicle. So that is uh, that is accessible for people with legitimate physical disabilities. Good to know. Good to know. Okay, and one one last question here, and then we'll do our lightning round, and then we got to wrap it up for the night. Uh, but Kate, let me pick on you again, just because I haven't been picking on you nearly enough. Uh, but when you go out on a hunt, what kinds of things should you do to be a good steward of the land that you're on? Uh, I try to always, at a very minimum, take out everything I came in with. Um, and I often try to take out more than I came in with because, uh, unfortunately, in public land, you will see a lot of garbage. Um, you know, just leftover soda cans or bottles or people's hand warmers or whatever was left behind from hunting or otherwise. Um, so, so I would say that's, you know, a big thing. And also just kind of being courteous to other hunters too, when you encounter them. 
um, hunters can kind of tend to mean mug each other a little bit because you want there to be more hunters from an advocacy standpoint, but you don't ever want to see other hunters in the field, you know? So, you know, I, I'd say those, those two things would be the biggest for me. And uh, let me pick on one other person just for like a follow on question real quick. Uh, so is there any like unwritten etiquette for how to uh, maneuver in the field if you see another hunter? Like, you know, I, I mean, I'm assuming you'd want to avoid scaring away their game or, you know, so is there etiquette there? What is it? And what do you do? Uh, Pat, we'll pick on you first. Well, for starters, don't use the scope on your gun to look at the other <laughs> hunter. Oh, what? Um, unfortunately, <laughs> oh yeah, you hear about that happening every freaking oh. season and it just blows me away. I'm like, you are, you're a moron. So that breaks one of the cardinal rules of gun safety of pointing it at something you don't intend to destroy. So don't do that. Um, generally speaking, if you're on public land and you have to cross somebody else, I mean, I've seen guys basically walk through a swamp so that they don't have to walk in front of another guy. I always just take the shortest route that gets me out of their out of their area as fast as I can. So if it means I have to cut right in front of them, I just wave at them. I smile. I say, I'm sorry. You know, I, I'm not usually moving on public land during legal shooting hours. I move before and after. So I'm, I'm in the spot where I'm going to hunt before anybody else gets out there usually. But, you know, it, it happens. You just have to be polite with each other. Don't get mad. Um, Jesus, don't get mad. There's there's also stories of people every year who get somebody yelling at them, pointing guns at them, vandalizing their truck, vandalizing their stand. I mean, it. you just have to be polite and be cautious, be courteous. Remember, you're all out there to enjoy the great outdoors. So, That's good advice just in general. Anything you want to add there, JJ, before we wrap up? I would say really be cognizant of uh, zones of fire. Um, particularly, I've uh, I personally run into this in waterfowl hunting. Uh, you get set up and somebody sets up uh, directly across from you on the, the, the <laughs> pond you're hunting. And all of a sudden they fire and you've got shot raining down on you. Uh, you don't think about, you know, I'm shooting at a target that's only 30 yards out, but that shot's going to travel two, three, four, five hundred 500 yards. Uh, same deal with your, you know, deer hunting or anything else. Understand where, um, you know, where people's are, shoulders are pointed, try to not get in front of them, I think would be the the, the simplest and, and probably the most safe way to get through the field to make sure that you don't end up with uh, unintended lead uh, underneath your skin. All right, that's legit. Okay, super quick lightning round before we end here. Uh, I'd like to hear from each of you, what is your favorite game recipe and are you willing to share your secrets in the Facebook comments? Uh, Kate, what's yours? Uh, I, I think my favorite is probably um, shoulder barbacoa. So I think shoulder meat often Ooh. gets thrown into the grinder grinder pile by a lot of by a lot of people, but it's a really great medium for barbacoa or other shredded meats. Um, so I make a nice spicy barbacoa out of every antelope shoulder and every uh, venison shoulder that I get. Ooh, that sounds awesome! All right, JJ, how about share. you? Thank you. Uh, you know, my wife and I are uh, big into uh, canning, so we tend to can, you know, wild plums or peaches or, you know, fruit that we can pick. Uh, so for me, it would be taking, uh, you know, a fruit preserve and a nice grilled uh, upland meat, uh, grouse or pheasant primarily. Uh, so just uh, salt and pepper, you know, mild, mild on the, the spices, but uh, ladle it uh, in the fi finishing, glaze it with uh, with some wild um I think that's a that's a pretty high on my list. Oh, that sounds legit. And Pat, how about you? All right. So I go frou frou and I like charcuterie. So I make a venison pastrami where you take literally any cut of venison that you want and you stick it with uh, salt and brown sugar, essentially, and a few herbs and spices in a bag and let it sit and age in your and cure in your fridge for about two weeks and then pop it into a smoker for two or three hours and at very low temperature but high smoke and slice it really thinly and it is delicious. Ooh. Ooh, that sounds amazing, yeah. Uh, and if you guys get a chance, definitely stop by the Facebook comments, share your awesome recipes so that everybody watching can learn from you guys. All right, well, thank you so much for watching Caucus Live. Check out our YouTube channel. Uh, we're going to be archiving our live stream uh, 
content there as well. So that's Minnesota Gun Owners Caucus on YouTube. Uh, next week, we're going to be talking about precision rifle competition with a panel of expert competitors. And if you've ever wondered how they hit those like tiny little targets that are so far away, they look like postage stamps. Join us next week to find out from the experts. That's going to be next Wednesday, October 28th at 7 p.m. And once again, just a reminder, if you've got a couple extra minutes, uh, swing by our uh, caucus uh, door knocking event in Bemidji. So for more information about that, go to the caucus uh, main Facebook page, click on events and join us in Bemidji. Thanks for watching and good night.